Hi everyone, I'm Avi Savar, president of SUSE, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our second annual State of the Consumer Summit. We launched the State of the Consumer series in March of 2020. We did it as a way to help you navigate through unprecedented times. Here we are a year and a half later, having produced a library of webinars and now bringing you our second annual summit. We hoped this year's event would be in person, but unfortunately the Delta variant had some other plans. Hopefully next year these unprecedented times maybe will be a little bit more precedented and we can see each other in person. But for now, we remain virtual. We do, however, have a jam-packed agenda that we're super excited about. In just a few minutes, we're going to kick things off with Susie's SVP of Market Research, Will Cimarosa and Allison Wong from our Center of Excellence. They're gonna lead a presentation on how you can leverage behaviors and motivations to build a consumer-centric brand. After that, Susie's Chief Product Officer, Nick Goshat, will join Will and Allie for a product preview and give you a sneak peek at some of our latest innovations and our newest offering. Once they're done, Susie's Chief Customer Officer, Katie Gross, will lead an expert panel discussing how brands can stay relevant in a diverse world. The panel will feature Elliot Rosen, Growth Manager at Unilever, Michelle Esgar, Senior Group Manager, Marketing and Brand Experience at Panasonic, Sonia Thompson of the Thompson Media Group, and our dear friend, Dr. Joel Meyer, who is shaping the next generation of researchers and marketers at the University of Richmond's Business School. Of course, it would not be a State of the Consumer Summit without a trends report by our very own founder and CEO, Matt Britton. Matt is going to explore how consumers are feeling as we head into yet another uncertain year. And knowing Matt, you are in for a fun ride. Wrapping up today's program, we're going to do a Q&A session with the Suzy team. So please submit your questions throughout all of today's sessions using the chat box on your screen. We're gonna answer as many of them as we can at the end of the day. We're also gonna be sharing all the recordings and presentation materials from today's sessions early next week. So if you do miss any part of the afternoon or you just wanna rewatch, don't worry, we've got you covered. Before I hand off to Will and Allie, I did wanna take a minute and express our sincerest gratitude to all of you, all of our customers. We launched this platform less than four years ago, and there is no doubt that your support, your ongoing feedback, and your belief in our mission is what has propelled Suzy into a category leader today. Our mission is to enable human understanding, and our vision is to build the insights cloud of the future. We want to do everything in our power to help you get keep and grow your customers at every stage of the commercial funnel. From foundational learning to product innovation, go to market campaigns, in market tracking and everything in between. We do not think this world is slowing down. Consumer sentiment and behavior seems to change at every new cycle. And so we believe human understanding is more important than ever. Speaking of news cycles, you may have heard that we recently closed a $50 million Series D financing. Well, I assure you that we do plan to put our money where our mouth is, investing in a roadmap across all of our product lines. We will, of course, keep investing in our core Suzy system, helping you generate insights at the speed of culture. We plan to develop and launch more action types, more templates, more functionality, starting with survey previews, survey piping, and a dozen new templates launching in platform in just a few weeks. We're also laying the groundwork for features you will see early next year, features like projects and sharing, so you can work easier, faster, and smarter. This time last year, we launched Suzy Live putting qualitative research at your fingertips. The response to Suzy Live was awesome. The positive feedback on our unique ability to connect qual and quant in one integrated system has been very exciting and inspiring for us. So we plan to continue investing further in Suzy Live. 
This includes launching new use cases like screen sharing for UX testing. This is going to be available before the end of this year. And multi-person focus groups, which we're going to be launching in early 2022. At the heart of our system is Suzy Audiences, giving you access to the highest quality screened and verified consumers, built right in and seamlessly integrated. We do know that having an integrated audience is a big part of what makes Suzy special. We also know that quality is the single most important attribute when it comes to audiences. So even though you won't see it as part of the front end Suzy experience, we're investing heavily behind the scenes, including the development of a patent pending system we're calling Biotic. All you need to know about Biotic is that it's going to be working in the background to ensure that our audience remains high quality, diverse, and engaged. Lastly, we know that speed to responses is just one piece of the equation. The Suzy Solutions Roadmap is intended to deliver speed to outcomes through agile research workflows like easy to use templates, custom trackers, and even more robust integrations. Next quarter, we're going to be launching an audience segmentation solution to help you better profile consumers, identify and measure category usage drivers, attitudes, brand perceptions, and need states. In early 2022, we're going to launch our Suzy Connect API, allowing for easy integration with platforms like Power BI and Tableau, and eventually third-party data sources and other systems. All of this sets the stage for an advanced data explorer product, which we plan to release sometime in the middle of next year. Okay, so that was a lot. And if you can believe it, it's only a sliver of what we do have planned for the future. But right now I wanna bring us back to this quarter, back to today, because today, drum roll please, we're gonna talk about our newest solution. I wanna introduce you to Suzy Home. Now, Suzy can test your products as they're meant to be used, hands-on and at home, letting consumers experience your product in their lives. Suzy Home combines qualitative and quantitative research so you can identify motivations and those moments of truth. And you don't have to worry about any of the logistics. The platform does all the heavy lifting from screeners to product fulfillment and the surveys in between. We are incredibly excited to introduce you to Suzy Home, and in just a few weeks, you will be able to initiate an in-home usage test right from inside the platform. I'm not going to steal any more of the team's thunder. They are eager and super excited to share more with you. So with that, it is my pleasure to hand the virtual stage over to Will and Allie to kick off what I hope will be a terrific summit full of insights and inspiration. Thank you. Thanks, Avi. Allison and I are excited to talk about building consumer-centric brands around behaviors and motivations. We're going to start with some examples. What do smartphones, brandy, tube socks, and motorcycles all tell us about understanding human motivations and the potential for brand growth? We're going to look at some examples on how motivations at specific moments that matter are key to really understanding how to position your brand in a way that's going to keep you relevant and it's going to continue to drive brand growth. What we're seeing here now is a, is a highlight from a recent study that was conducted at the University of California. Um, the interest was to explore and understand why HTC, a smartphone brand that's quite sizable, failed in key markets. These two markets you see here are Hong Kong and Indonesia. Uh, the University of California used an approach called structural equation modeling that looks at how latent variables influence actual behaviors. And this study was conducted with smartphone users um, in both of these markets to understand what the motivations for purchasing were. Um, what we see here is that the structural equation model research in Hong Kong found that consumers were most likely to buy and be satisfied with their products when the smartphone was presented to them as a status symbol. The thing that was important to these consumers was that being seen with their smartphone and communicating to those who are witnessing you use that smartphone was that you were indicating that you had some sort of status. It was an issue of badge value. What was interesting about this study was that at the time, um, Apple and HTC had very similar budgets in terms of marketing spends. What they found was that HTC was communicating their product experience 
more as a set of features and how many features would you get in relationship to that of Apple. That's a great message that you can be very strong and, and communicate through a number of different channels. The problem was consumers didn't care. What they wanted to, to hear, what they were motivated by was the status symbol of the phone. And that was a key reason that HTC um, is hypothesized to have failed in the Hong Kong market. A similar thing happened at uh, in Indonesia. Um, Apple was also very quite effective at communicating how well their product worked, right? How it was reliable and how it would seemingly integrate with their day to day. HTC carried over the same functional uh, comparison uh, campaign that also wasn't uh, as motivation to, m motivational to these consumers. Here we have two brands that had very similar levels of quality and ability to reach their consumers. It was a miss of the motivation and in the moments that matter that caused HCC to fail. Another famous example um, that, that brings to life how important understanding um, the motivations at, within specific moments that matter is the taste transfer uh, uh, example that was made famous by Cheskin. Um, this example was a study that was conducted by Christian Brothers, a well-established brand player in the brandy industry um, that had a very strong user base. They wanted to understand, though, why were they not winning new users, um, especially in relation to a brand that was called e &J, a relatively newcomer um, in, into, the, into the category. What Cheskin did was actually conduct a sensory study. They conducted taste blinded taste tests for both the brands. Christian Brothers expected to win because they had spent so much time in that in that category developing and owning their, their higher quality taste experience. And the sensory test demonstrated that. Um, it was outperforming the E&J. But what they found was that E&J consumers were more motivated by something else. And that was demonstrated when they switched the brandies and the bottles. When Christian Brothers was put inside the E&J bottle, E&J users and Christian Brothers both rated the taste experience as superior. What was happening was the experience of the package itself, which was perceived as being premium and luxurious and of the highest quality, was actually impacting the way the consumers perceived the taste experience. What Christian Brothers found out was that their motivation was to perceive quality in the aesthetics that was driving um, change in the market. And they needed to quickly update their packaging to, to avoid that taste transference issue. A recent uh, publication, Confabulation, also has a great example. In this example of why moments that matter and, and motivations are important, um, is demonstrated in a study that was done with five identical pairs of tube socks. A wide range of consumers were brought in for a quantitative study with qualitative feedback in which they were asked to select the superior tube sock and which one they would buy. The tube socks, while all the same, there was a winner. Right? It was actually tube sock pair four and five, and it was winning by roughly the same percentage of left-handed to right-handedness in, in the general population. But what was interesting about the results was the qualitative component, component. When the consumers were asked why they selected that set of tube socks, they were able to tell great stories about the quality of the stitching, their experience with different materials, and different levels of uh, quality in terms of tube socks, which had made them expert enough to be able to, to identify the tube sock that they thought was superior. In this case, the moments that matter had already occurred. They were being motivated by their ability to determine what high quality would actually um, be. And then last but not least is an example of the motorcycle. Um, I like to, to reference Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance whenever I can. I think it's a great way of looking at quality and experience. And Persing writes about his experience on the motorcycle. He writes about the experience specifically. He says, you experience the landscape on a motorcycle in a way that's completely different. In a car, you're always in a compartment. And because you're used to it, you don't realize that through the car window, everything you see is just more TV. On a cycle, that frame is gone. You're in the scene. You're not just watching it anymore, but you're flying through an ever-changing uh, landscape of temperatures and smells. For him, the motorcycle wasn't about the look or the raw power or, or any of the aesthetics. It was about the experience of being immersed into the landscape. A moment for him was, was critical that he experienced the, the world around him. 
So what we see at a high level is that when we look at the moments that matter and, and, and through mo a motivational framework, we see that in some markets, smartphone motivations were determined by the brand value or the, the brand stature and the ability to communicate status. In the brandy example, we saw that the ability to grow your brand was tied to the perception that this was a luxury brand, a high quality brand. In terms of tube socks, one of the most generic things ever, it was about quality, the quality of the stitching and of the cloth. And in the motorcycle example, it's about immersion. Right, being part of the landscape and traveling through it rather than witnessing it through just another window that becomes more TV. This is, becomes an even more difficult thing to deal with in today's world when we're constantly looking at ways to stay always on, to stay competitive with our brand marketing. You know, the reason that, that how brands grow has become so popular is because it's actually filled with good advice. Right? You do need to continuously reach all buyers of your category. You should never be silent in terms of communication and distribution. Ensure that your brand is easy to buy, that it's easy to notice. You need to constantly be refreshing and rebuilding your memory structures, creating and using distinctive brand assets, and to be consi consistent in order to stay competitive. But if you don't know what the major motivations are and the experiences that make your brand competitive and separate it from the rest, that align with what those consumer needs are, all of this is meaningless. What are the messages that you need to be continuously reaching your consumers with, right? What is the experience that they are actually even buying? What is it specifically that you need to get noticed about? What are those memory structures that are relevant, right? And what are the brand assets that bring those to life so that you can be both consistent and competitive? This becomes even more challenging when we, and, and convoluted when we look at the increasingly complex marketing tech ecosystem. This is in the background of the slide you see a zoomed out version of all of the channel communication platforms that are available today, right? It's, it's, a, it's an endless myriad of, of mazes and different types of touch points that you need to navigate and figure out how to communicate those messages within the context of the moments that matter. So what are we to do, all right? We recommend going back to basics. Let's break this down into its components to solve the problem, right? And at the end of the day, what is the problem that we really do need to solve? Right? It's all about brand growth. We're not looking to understand our consumers just for the academic value of it. We're doing it to grow our brands. To grow our brands, we need three things we need to do. We need to get new consumers. They need to enter the category for your product or your brand. We need to keep them by driving uh, loyalty um, to those who have actually tried it. And by growing, getting more people to use your brand more often or for more reasons. Right, Ali, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the research questions that we typically have to deal with in order to answer these types of questions around behavior change. Yeah, for sure. So Will outlined some key behavioral changes that need to happen when we're looking at this growth funnel. And here are some research questions that come out of, of the behavior changes that need to happen. So we need to think about what drives category entry, what drives brand loyalty, and also what drives brand usage when we think about this growth funnel and how we want to drive behavioral change in consumers. So when we think about these research questions, it's also really important to think about our product brand development life cycle, which is how CZ tends to approach research. And um, if you've worked with us before, you may have seen this slide, but uh, we're gonna go over it one more time in case there's any new people and just as a refresher to how CZ approaches research. So we have our four main pillars within this development life cycle. And they all iterate and inform each other as we are working through all of our research challenges and approaching how to best serve um, and you know, define our customers and also see what they need and bring things to market with them as well as track the performance of things already existing in the market. So starting off with foundational learning, this is about identifying who your consumer is. What are their needs? What is driving their behaviors? And how do we drive behavioral change within the consumers that you're trying to target? Uh, well, once we've defined your consumer and your audience and who you'd like to talk to, who you maybe would potentially like to reach in the future, uh, that will inform your innovation pipeline. And that's about pinpointing the best products and services that are needed or desired by your brand users and perhaps the users that you would like to bring into your brand and add to your consumer base. So once we have that innovation pipeline going and we've pinpointed those different products and services, we then focus on campaign development. So how do we drive demand for these things that we have just innovated on and uh, landed on for the brand? And also how do we best 
show these in, to consumers in their best light. So once we have campaigns, we then also will focus on brand and product tracking. So how are these products and services performing in market? How are they performing against previously launched products that your brand has focused on before, but also how is it performing in the competitive market? So it's important to note that all of these pillars are important and inform each other, but it's also critically important that we develop feedback loops within each of these pillars. And the reason why we need these feedback loops is that our consumer landscape is constantly changing. Um, once we do foundational learning, it's not like we can just close the book on that and say that is our consumer and that's set in stone. Um, that is certainly not the case. And we need to constantly iterate and revisit who we're talking to. Maybe your consumer base has changed in the past year. Um, we have noticed that a lot with our clients at Suzy uh, because of something called the COVID-19 pandemic hmm. and what has happened in 2020. So a lot of our clients are seeing the need to revisit their foundational learning and consistently keep tabs on the consumers that they like to talk to. Um, again, that uh, is also applicable to the innovation pipeline. You know, products and services need to change to meet the demands of our consumers. How we market those products and services also may need to change in light of what has happened in the past year. And again, with brand and product tracking, uh, it's important to have consistency with what you're tracking, but also it's important to know that you're tracking the right metrics and those metrics may have changed um, or continually need uh, revision as we move through the world that we live in today. Um, these pillars talk to each other, but we also need to keep iterating within these different pillars of research. We've also seen a lot of success with the quant qual mix methodology to create that feedback loop, whether it's the foundational study um, to understand what those motivations are or your innovation and campaign uh, studies to make sure that you're actually bringing those motivations to life in the products and services and the messages about them. Creating that feedback loop has been, been key. Let's take a look at how that actually works in, from a traditional standpoint and how we wanna optimize that experience uh, together. Yep. So we're gonna go through a typical quant qual feedback loop. And this is in the context of a foundational study in that more foundational first pillar research. However, keep in mind that this, this happens throughout all four pillars of research, and we're just focusing on that first pillar for today's discussion. Um, so at the start, we have some screener and QRE generation. And um, this is when you're developing your analytical plan, you're aligning on different categories uh, for, the, for the space that you play in, and also building up the different attributes you like to measure uh, your consumer base on. So this is kind of that first stage. We're really thinking about mapping out who your consumer is and developing the plan to get us there. So once we, and that takes around one to two weeks. So once we have our analytical plan, we focus more on the qual and longitudinal exploratory research. And um, you know this can be anything from IDIs, where we would uh, encourage the use of our Suzy Live tool. It can be focus groups. Um, and uh, back when we could get, get together and get people in a room, we would conduct live interviews or intercept interviews. Uh, with people. So um, that takes around four to six weeks. Uh, you know, there's a lot of scheduling and logistics that goes on into this, but we're, we want to analyze more of our qualitative research to make sure that that's informing our analytical plan um, and giving us the data if, that we need. If we go back to one of the examples we shared, for, uh, let's use the HTC example. This is the moment where you're going to explore all the different experiences in different moments with con actual consumers. Right. This is where you learn about the different attributes of the experience, whether it's a status symbol, whether it's um, communicating uh, about the tools or whether it's getting things done. You're going to learn about that experience so that you can then go on and measure it and actually find out what are those experiences that are most relevant and, and correlated to uh, brand usage. Yep. Um, this is definitely the stage where you can start to tweak different attributes. You can find out what's resonating with consumers. And once you've done that call piece, then you'll be conducting your quantitative research. And this is launching a survey and um, making sure you know, that people have a chance to respond in this way as well beyond the qualitative uh, 
measures that we spoke of earlier. Um, so that also takes around two to three weeks to conduct the quantitative piece um, that was informed by the qualitative piece, as well as mentioning. So, yeah, this is, the, this is the chance to actually measure like the reach and the strength of, the, of those moments and those experiences and do the analysis, which is our next step, in terms of the correlation of what actually drives brand usage and brand satisfaction. Yep, exactly. So then once we have all of these different pieces together that took a, a long time to get together, uh, we'll do some analysis. So we'll consolidate files, we're gonna clean and code, we're going to try and run some factor analysis and get some clusters and segments going so that we can better bucket your target audience into relevant segments of interest uh, that you can target easily and go back to for deeper uh, levels of research, whether that's your innovation pipeline, whether that's campaign development, or also whether that's tracking. So this is the part where we are bringing everything together to help map out the audience that you would like to talk to and that's important to your brand and your products that you're uh, offering. So that takes around two to three weeks as well. And then once that's all done, uh, we, we tend to run share outs and learning workshops with our clients uh, when doing this foundational work to help better tweak what we've created and make sure it's working and also um, help build out recommendations afterwards. Now that we have your foundational studies, uh, done. Let's try and see how we can apply these to your research so you can get answers quickly. So um, what you should take away from this lovely quant qual feedback loop that we've presented is that this takes a long time. It's slow, it's complicated, and it can be very costly. Uh, it can cost around 150 to 200, 150 to 200 thousand uh, dollars, you know, a lot of money. Um, and also it takes around three months to conduct. So when you're thinking about this, uh, let's, let's imagine that you ran this study in 2019, uh, thinking that this was great, this was going to set up your 2020 perfectly. Um, you, you put in the time, you put in the money, you put in the effort, and suddenly you realize 2020 happened and maybe things that you did in 2019 are not as relevant as they might be in the context of what happened in 2020. Uh, we're still in a global pandemic. There have been a lot of social movements and social unrest. Um, the 2020 census happened. So we realized that there have been some demographic shifts in the last decade that we need to account for. So t pulling this all together, you realize uh, in 2021 that you are looking at this. A dumpster fire. <laughs> Right? Yep. We've just talked about how important it is to understand the moments that matter and the motivations. And we see that there are well-established ways to do this that are, that are thorough, but they're also time uh, consuming. Three months is a long time and very expensive. Consequently, we tend to do these, just every, these types of foundational studies every three to four years, right? If I'm in a, a brand and I just conducted one of these in 2019 and I'm looking out into the future, I feel like those learnings are a dumpster fire. Um, it's particularly concerning given how quickly things are changing in this day and age. Um, let's take a, a heat map approach to really why in terms of this dump, dumpster fire. Here you can see from a heat map perspective, anything that you knew about your occasions or your different segments. I'm not sure how confident I'm going to be just 18 months ago based on all the things that Ali demonstrated to show that's happened. Right? How confident really am I in norms anymore, normative behaviors, when behaviors and need states change so often? How do I know what those moments and those experiences really are when things change so fast? And I think one of the, the, the things that would really cause the most burn and smoke is really looking at my 22 learning plan. How do I stay in the moment? How do I understand what those motivations are and those moments that matter in my 2022 20 research plan when things continue to change at increasingly fast rates? How do I keep in the moment? How do I understand what those motivations are? How do I check them in a, from a foundational moment to actually making sure that my innovation is hitting those moments in the right way, my campaigns are communicating it, and how do I track that performance? All right. This is, this is the, the thing that we've been thinking about. We think that there's a new way. You don't have to wait three months and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a way to create a feedback loop um, in a more agile way that's going to allow you to understand, identify, and measure the moments that matter against key motivations so that you don't ever find yourself being in an HTC type situation. So let's talk about some drivers of behavior. 
it's helpful to take stock of, of the motivations, right? And we've got here an image of uh, a teacher taking attendance, right? The reason we've got this up is to understand what drives behavior, we're gonna have to take attendance. And you can't ask, you know, or take attendance by asking who's not here. Every wise person ever has, has used that example, right? You need to really understand what the things are that should be there and look to see if they're missing. Okay. So let's look at moments of truth. And let's look at motivations. On the left, you see human motivations. The range of human motivations have been actually already thoroughly explored and measured by psychologists. There's a very well-established um, intellectual knowledge of what motivates people and what gets them to change their behavior. What you see here are key buckets. While not everyone agrees on the relationship of these and the importance of these motivations, they've been fairly well understood and established as key things that drive people to do what they do, right? We know what those are. We need to start thinking about what those motivations are and do it in a way that looks at uh, looks at those motivations within the moments of truth. Fortunately for us also, if we're going to take attendance, not only have psychologists um, determined what are the motivations, but, but marketers and insights professionals have identified that there are key moments of truth that are relevant to grow, uh, driving your brand growth as well. And by taking stock of how human motivations are playing out during the moments that matter, we can ensure our brands maximize their relevance and appeal. We can make sure that we're creating the right experiences in the right moments. And quickly, I just wanna make sure that people are understanding what these different moments of truth are before we move into the actual application. So for the zero moment of truth, this is you know leading up to uh, research. This is me on my phone in CVS looking up to see if there's a difference between like a generic medicine versus the name brand, right? I'm kind of just doing my research, seeing what I'd like to buy, what are the benefits, what are the pros and cons of, of what I'm looking at. Um, the first moment of truth is when a consumer chooses to buy one product over the, over the other um, and taking it to the register, uh, you've decided to make a purchase. Um, the second moment of truth is when you're experiencing the product for the first time. Um, and then the third moment of truth is what what the, what perception has been formed once you've experienced this. Uh, do you want to tell a friend about what you've experienced, good or bad? Um, are you going to purchase this product again, etc. So these moments of truth are really important when we're taking stock of um, motivations and uh, what's driving behavior um, behind the products and services that we're putting out to the world. Um, great, so now that we've gone over the different moments of truth, let's give it a try. I'll try. <laughs> so here we have um, the framework that we suggest you use to develop the range of attributes that you can either ask and explore about qualitatively or measure quantitatively. Let's use an example um, of the, based on the safety driver. The safety need is the range of uh, needs and motivations that are obviously tied not only to people's safety and personal security, but it's also been um, correlated to um, employment confidence around your, your future and being able to have a job, the resources that you have access to that you can leverage, your health, and even your property. All right. An example of uh, an attribute that, that could be explored both qualitatively or measured quantitatively is the statement, I feel I have control over my health and wellness. At the zero moment of truth, when someone is first realizing that they have a need um, for a health and wellness product and they're beginning to do that research, depending on how consumers feel about that control over their health and wellness is going to change the context of how you're going to communicate to them when they start to do that research. This is the opportunity you have to make sure that your brand um, in terms of the motivations is aligned to the actual moments of need and what matters and is relevant to them. It's consumers who have a strong sense of control over their health and wellness may not be on the same consumer experience journey as someone who doesn't. These are the types of things that you need to understand about your brand and about the category if you're going to effectively communicate them in terms of your always on and fresh assets and developing memory structures. You have to understand what those moments are and those motivations are to be relevant. Yep, and then some other attributes to think about would be something like I feel financially secure. So if you feel financially secure, I'm going to think about my consumer differently if they might have, you know, money that they can spend on things as opposed to being a little more cash strapped. It's very important to get the messaging right for that type of consumer or about something maybe like I have control over, over my health and wellness. 
right? So if you are striving to market a product that can change somebody's life, it's, it's very important that they feel like they also have the agency to do that and perhaps might be more encouraged to buy a product like that. So um, it's important to really nail down these survey attributes and get the right mix and blend as you're looking at your consumers. But safety is certainly a very important motivation uh, that we, we strive to understand when we're doing this type of foundational work. Let's look at love and belonging. Another example. The love and belonging need is the range of motivations and needs that are tied to friendship, intimacy, family, and the general sense of connection to both people and brands, right? Well, what, how would we take an assessment of this or take attendance for the first moment of truth? Uh, an attribute that we've seen used a lot um, quite successfully that's tied to the love and belonging motivations and moments is the statement, is a brand I feel good about buying for my family, right? Remember, this first moment is the moment when a consumer chooses to buy one over the other. What are the elements or the co components about your brand that would make someone feel this way? We've seen this statement actually being tied to um, satisfaction and intent to buy quite often, right? So understanding what it is that leads someone to feel like they're going to be proud to give this to their family, to enhance that love and belonging motivation is also going to be key to understanding what you need to do during this first moment, this first mo moment of truth. Ali, you've done a lot of these types of studies. What are some other examples of attributes um, that you've you've seen for uh, this motivation? Yeah, I've definitely worked a lot with this one. Um, I think uh, I've worked with, I remember a statement that was saying, it's, it's a bit sad, but um, I feel lonely often. Um, understanding that if somebody feels lonely and isolated, there might be a product or a service that can really help them feel more connected. I think you think about social media and connecting with people and staying connected with your friends, even though you might not see them every day. Um, and especially in the context of the pandemic, loneliness was certainly an issue that swept our nation and swept the world. So um, understanding that it your consumers is. are... What? It still is. We're, we're doing this virtually. <laughs> well, that's why we're set up in our homes filming this webinar. Um, but yeah, understanding loneliness and the need for connection has been something that I've seen a lot in the work I've done in the past year. Um, and it certainly plays into love and belonging. And uh, hopefully this will be over soon and we can get together in person. But um, we definitely are relying a lot on technology and other means to connect to others. So um, something like loneliness, something like feeling like you're part of a community um, or, you know, with remote work, feeling like you're a part of uh, the, the company that you work for and that you are one with your colleagues that you may have never met before um, is very important. Let's look at esteem, right? The esteem need is uh, tied to respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, and freedom. All right. Um, an example of uh, an attribute that you could explore, again, both quantitatively or qualitatively, is a brand that I would hesitate to be seen with or makes me feel like a successful person. Um, this You can already see how it would be related to some of the examples we shared, right, in terms of badge value. Um, looking at this from a third moment of truth, the, the perception that's created after living with a brand for a while is going to be key, a key moment to understand in terms of motivations. Brands that don't connect well with their consumers can can be something that you're hesitating to be seen with if you don't feel that sense of connection. Or vice versa, a brand that's connected with the need for prestige, like we saw in Hong Kong with Apple, it can make you feel like a successful person, right? This is an example of how um, understanding what that overall experience needs to be in that right moment is going to make sure that your brand is aligned with what's going to drive the behavior change of buying it, relating to it, using it again, and using it more often. Ali, we've done a lot of esteem studies lately as well. What are some other examples yeah. of, of of areas of exploration for, for quant and qual um, use? Yeah, so I think um, some something around perhaps mental and physical health has been really important in the past year as well to help drive your esteem. And um, like I mentioned before, having changed to this more virtual landscape, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and addressing that and understanding that within our consumers since that's gotten very difficult um, and continues to be difficult. So something about you know caring about your mental and physical health. Um, another thing might be respect from colleagues and peers. Um, you know, as we uh, interact virtually through screens, it might be very hard to feel like you're getting positive affirmation or that you're doing a great job at you know, when we sit in a room for eight hours a day by ourselves um, and interact through things like Slack and Zoom. So um, understanding 
that uh, self-esteem, status, and recognition are still important and perhaps have changed in the way that we uh, gather esteem in a more virtual environment. Um, all very important things. So things about mental and physical health, um, feeling respect, feeling like you're part of a team. Again, um, it, this one definitely ties closely to love and belonging. They definitely go hand in hand. Then aesthetic uh, human motivations. Um, some of you might recognize these motivations from the classic Maslow hierarchy, which is how we're using this to take attendance. A recent addition to this is the aesthetic motivation that wasn't traditionally there. This is one that's particularly relevant to brands as well, because this motivation is tied to one's pursuit of beauty, creative expression and appreciation. Um, how well we aesthetically connect with a brand or an experience is actually quite important. Um, let's look at an example uh, in terms of how this would be relevant at the second moment of truth, when the qualities of the product purchased are experienced for that first time. You might want to understand, see, does this seem like a high quality product? Does this feel like a premium product? Imagine if um, E&J was able to keep track of this back in the day when they were having the problems they had with um, losing share, right? You want to understand what are the experiences and then make sure that you're living up to those expectations. Knowing and that, that if this is supposed to be a high quality or premium product, you want to make sure that you're asking those consumers about that at that moment of truth. When they're first experiencing the product, you need to meet those expectations. We've done a lot of aesthetic um, uh, research because brands need to know how that experience is playing out, regardless of the moment of, of truth. Ali, what are some examples of, of attributes that we've explored both qualitatively and quantitatively that are tied to um, aesthetic motivations? Yeah, I think, again, aesthetics have changed a lot um, and how we express our own aesthetic has changed. Um, I know that there was definitely a few articles um, that I've read where it's all about that nice Zoom background, that bookshelf, that plant that's hanging in the corner. And I think it's important to pin down for consumers whether your your consumer base is, uh, you know, cares a lot about the living space that they uh, occupy. So things like the way I decorate my living room is very important to me. The way I dress is an important part of who I am. Um, you know, I regularly am browsing for ways to, you know, you know, clothes or, or makeup or different things to decorate my space and also project who I am as an individual. Um, when we're all little Zoom boxes on a screen, how are you going to stand out and project your aesthetic? Um, is it going to be through high quality brands, premium products? Is it going to be through just, you know, how you cultivate and show the place that you live and, and breathe in? Um, so just pinpointing those motivations um, through consumers and what they're looking for and uh, who, who they are really when it comes to aesthetics. Um, so yeah, we've also seen an uptick in these. I mean, we, we've done a lot of research across all these motivations because they've shifted so much. Um, so yeah, things, things, things like that. Well then last but not least is self-actualization, right? This is the need of motivations really that are tied to your desire to be more than you can be, right? Achieving your potential. Um, being able to creatively problem solve, like like growing as a human being. Um, this is this is something that has been measured and understood in the world of psychology as, as another core motivation. And it's actually surprisingly relevant, to, surprisingly relevant to brands, right? At that zero moment of truth, when someone is first experiencing the need for something and beginning to do research, um, consider this attribute, right? Is a product that will help me improve my overall fitness, right? Let's say that you realize, oh man, I'm out of shape. I've had that realization quite a bit as I've been working from home in this COVID environment, right? Knowing that whether or not a consumer thinks your brand or your category or your product is something that can help them with something, especially when they're looking to improve, is going to be critical to being relevant to that consumer. Understanding what it is that they need from your product, um, especially when it comes to not just consuming something, but consuming something that's going to improve them, really gives you a strong opportunity to connect with that consumer, um, to actually motivate them in those moments that matter. Um, we've done a lot of also self-actuation exploration. What are some um, attributes we've explored quantitatively and qualitatively in terms of self-actualization in terms of these moments that matter? Yeah, I think that this leans heavily on things like potential. So I feel like I'm living up to my potential or I feel a sense of accomplishment with what I have done in the past six months um, or even it's as simple as having personal goals. Um, you, you've 
you feel that you have potential and you've set goals to help you get to a certain place. Um, those mindsets are very powerful when consumers are making decisions. And um, for example, I, I tend to actually run outside in, in my personal life. And when I feel when I have a race coming up, when I feel like I can shoot for that personal best or something like that, I'm in a mindset where I want all the tools that will help me get there. And, um, you know, if I wasn't in that mindset of feeling like I could achieve and I need every single thing to help me, then maybe I wouldn't be as interested. But I think it's all about feeling like you have potential, you have a goal and playing off that to help your consumers truly achieve um, is very powerful. And I have fallen prey to it a lot in the past year um, with a lot of different goals and things um, that I'd like to do when I have more downtime at home. So, um, yeah. Definitely, definitely feel this one. I think this is a really interesting one to dig into um, because seeing passions and seeing people with goals and wanting to achieve or helping people achieve is, is something very powerful. So. so we've talked about understanding motivations at the moments that matter, right? To this point, it's been somewhat academic, I would argue. We've looked at ways to understand and to approach exploring the range of motivations and um, within a moment right? Whether it's quantitative or qualitative. So how does this, this way of taking attendance help you stay relevant from a research perspective, right? Let's go back to the product development life cycle, loop, right? Whether it's understanding who your consumer is at a foundational level in terms of their needs and behaviors and size of price, or whether it has to do with making sure that your innovation and your comms are aligned to that, and that is performing that way in market. The feedback loop is something that you need to constantly be looking at using this exercise understanding what the range of motivations are across those moments that matter so that you can qualitatively and quantitatively get that feedback on how well your brand is performing. What are those motivations at those moments and what actually drives the behavior change? Putting this into your foundational approach in terms of or qualitative and quantitative innovation uh, exploration or your qualitative and quantitative campaign development or even exploring in-market usage, using this framework allows you to make sure that you've got the range of motivations and asking them in the context of the moments that matter. Let's bring it together, right? Let's apply this. We talked about HTC and Apple, right? This was a self-actualization moment, right? That was missed by HTC. When the consumers first experienced a need for this product, it was a desire for prestige to, to show that you had made it in the world, to, to show off your iPhone. That was something that had been missed. Using this type of approach, it wouldn't necessarily have been missed if you were able, if the brand was able to explore what motivated those consumers, understand it, and frame their product that way. The brandy example, right? It's it's interesting how much the aesthetic actually impacted the way a consumer experienced taste. What's interesting about this example, in terms of what was missed by EJ in this example, or Christian Brothers, is that 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 experience that happens between the first moment of truth when you first choose that brand and when you first experience it. We were able to understand that the qualities of the packaging, the, the aesthetic and the feel of that was actually impacting the way consumers were perceiving their experience in terms of taste. This was an opportunity by using this framework to uncover what those needs were so you wouldn't have had that challenge in terms of market share. The tube sock example, right? You, these, the issue of understanding how to motivate someone around your tube sock we saw there was two examples of this. It, it was re relevant to both the zero moment of truth, when a consumer feels like they've already established an understanding of what quality is within the context of, of a tube sock, and the third moment of truth, when someone's actually been able to experience it for a while. The consumers were encouraged to hold the sock and look at it. They were able to point to the quality of the stitching or the feel of the material. Right? This was in a great example of how understanding what those motivations are in those moments, this is how, would have brought that to life in that sense. And then again, we're seeing that aesthetic motivation in terms of emo uh, the immersion in the experience with a motorcycle, right? It wasn't just about the way the motorcycle looked, it was about the aesthetics of the experience of driving through the landscape, right? Being able to, to hone in on that, on that motivation throughout the consumer experience journey is going to really make sure that you're able to connect with them about the right type of brand uh, experience and create that motivation that's going to help you grow your brand. So this is all, been very academic, but the point is to show you that by using this framework, you can identify and uncover the range of motivations that are tied to the moments that matter. In our next presentation, we're actually going to bring this to life through our Happy Animal T-shirt company. We're going to execute an in-home use test 
and we're going to show you how we use this exercise to really understand the in-depth, the consumer experience journey and demonstrate how you no longer have to deal with a three to six month uh, life cycle of research and spend $200,000 to do this. We're gonna bring this to life in our next session now in terms of an actual product experience with Susie. Thanks everyone and see you in the next session.